In this lecture, we're going to go through the structure of peripheral nerves and the organization of spinal roots. Uh, we'll go through specific peripheral nerves in the lab section. Now, today, I just want to make sure we understand kind of what a nerve is made of and the basic organization from head to tail in our spinal cord. Um, so here we can see an image of an, an axon and of course axons are a big part of peripheral nerves. <clears throat> this is showing you the inside of the axon and showing you uh, the node that's marked with N and some uh, myelin, that would be the M1 and M2, so two different myelinated sections there. Uh, certainly myelination is an important aspect of peripheral nerves, uh, but not every nerve is myelinated, and whether or not a nerve is myelinated affects how quickly it transmits action potentials, and thus how quickly it communicates with its target. And that's the purpose of peripheral nerves, to convey information either into the central nervous system, if they're sensory in nature, or out of the central nervous system if they're motor in nature. Now, motor neurons could encounter skeletal muscle to help us move, or they could encounter viscera uh, in order to create some autonomic response. So all the nerves coming off of our spinal cord and many of the cranial nerves have both sensory and motor functions. So in the spinal cord we have our dorsal and ventral roots there, or your posterior and anterior roots, however you want to think of it. The motor neurons, or the efferents, the things that exit, these neurons exit through the ventral root. So this is ventral, and this is dorsal. E tells you that it exits, it's exiting the spinal cord, E ferrets. The sensory neurons don't live in the dorsal horn, although we do have neurons that live there. The primary sensory neurons live in the dorsal root ganglia. And they'll project out that dorsal root. So all this stuff is still true. We went over this earlier in the class. Now uh, these sensory neurons are either going to synapse locally to some interneuron. This can help us create reflexes. Uh, or they can project up in the posterior columns. We'll talk about those in this unit. So this would be true for non-pain sensing neurons. We also have pain sensing. They're a little smaller. They project out. They'll synapse locally. And these neurons cross over and project along the anterolateral pathway, the spinal thalamic tract. We'll cover these in later lectures. The focus now is on what happens here, on this aspect coming off of the whiteboard. And that'd be the emergence of spinal nerves. There can be some mixing of spinal nerves to create specific peripheral nerves. That certainly occurs. And in those peripheral nerves, we'll have both sensory and motor function. The motor comes from motor neurons in the ventral horn, and the sensory aspect is coming from the dorsal root ganglion. These we call afferents, or afferents, to stress that A. They arrive in the spinal cord. Motor exits. They're purely sensory and purely motor in the case of the dorsal root and the ventral root, respectively. They converge at the intervertebral foramen, or the hole between the different vertebrae. 
So we'll appreciate sensory uh, and motor live in their two distinct locations. Now let's consider what happens whenever we exit the spine. There's a few tracks that we take. So a little smaller spinal cord now, so we can consider what's going on. We got some motor and sensory neurons. We have a ventral root and a dorsal root that contains a ganglion. And this will be the space between our vertebrae here. Of course, there's a large centrum here. Well, spinal body there, the body of the, the spinal cord. Used to be called the centrum. Then we have our spinal arches up here. These are fused bony structures. And these are going to form a, a joint here that will have a little bit of space in it to allow for nerves to exit. And this will come back up here. There's another side over there. And this kind of wraps around. So that space would be our intravertebral foramen, or the hole between the vertebrae. <clears throat> At this point, we are a spinal root. Now we're coming off uh, the spinal cord there. As the cartoon is showing us, this is a, an excellent site for compression because we're flanked by bony structures. Those don't compress, so if we have any growth, any swelling of the nerve, that's going to put pressure on it. So it's a potential site for injury. Once we exit that intervertebral foramen, we're going to have some offshoots. So there's what we call the meningeal branch. This will be our first offshoot. That's actually going to come back. We're going to innervate a couple of things there. Um, there are some processes along the dura there. So this is my meningeal branch. Meninges is built right in there. So it makes sense that it targets the dura. So we can sense if there's any swelling there. Uh, it's not very dense innervation, so we can still do lumbar punctures. Uh, and then we also innervate the, the spine itself. So the, the ligaments and the discs in the spine. So whenever we have movement of discs or any sort of inflammation in the dura there or the spine, that creates back pain. So the meningeal branch is often not discussed, but it's pretty important. After that, little offshoot, if we are uh, from T1 to L2, then we're going to have so the, the communicating rami there. So this is our sympathetic chain ganglion, cross-section through it. So these are the postganglionic sympathetic neurons. So I got some neurons living in here. Well, we have to communicate with them. And this works just like it did earlier in the year. These neurons arise from the lateral horn, of course. Not the ventral horn. So if we're in T1 to L2, there's a special group of preganglionic autonomic neurons. They're going to do a little roundabout here. These axons are myelinated, making this communicating rami I'm sorry, this communicating ram is white. The postganglionic sympathetic neurons have unmyelinated axons, and that's what creates the gray ramus there. It's not myelinated, so it's gray. So we do the old switcheroo to go from pre to postganglionic. Of course, the preganglionic neurons still release acetylcholine, but our postganglionic release norepinephrine. Efferents, exiting the spinal cord, all release acetylcholine. doesn't matter whether you're a motor neuron or an, or an autonomic neuron. And if you're autonomic, it doesn't matter whether you're sympathetic or parasympathetic. You release acetylcholine. So in order to switch the neurotransmitter there, we synapse locally in sympathetic chain ganglion, and now we have noradrenergic neurons running through. We also, of course, still have our uh, ventral horn, motor neurons, and our, and our sensory components as well. And the last thing we got to do is 
split off here to form the dorsal and ventral rami. And again, these are still mixed, so they're going to have both sensory and motor elements in our dorsal and ventral rami. Uh, these elements here are going to innervate different parts of the body. So if you're dorsal, think dorsal. Ventral. Ventral is going to hit, of course, the front. Also the limbs. So dorsal hits the back, ventral hits the front. Now if we were to slice through, really anywhere along here, could be there, there, doesn't matter. A cross section through these peripheral nerves is going to show us that we have bundles of axons called fascicles. So the axons are surrounded by multiple layers of connective tissue called the mesoneurium. So these are the meninges of the peripheral nervous system. So let's get a cross section here of these peripheral nerves. Because there's a few barriers that are worth noting. So cross section through a nerve. The outer covering is the epineurium. This is continuous with the dura. So it's the same thing, it's just in the periphery. So around the nerve, epineurium, we have our dura. We have that tough covering that helps give the nerve some um, uh, some toughness to hold up to any stretching that goes on. So again, a bunch of collagen fibers makes the nerve very tough. So a little stretching won't break it. Uh, within, we're going to have a couple of other barriers here. So there's the, the perineurium and then the endoneurium. And the perineurium is what's going to actually create the little bundles of axons. So within our nerve, we'll find different size bundles of axons. All these little dots, these are just axons that have been cut through. And you'll notice I'm making some dots bigger and some smaller. That's totally on purpose because some axons are bigger and some are smaller. Motor axons are massive. Sensory axons can be pretty big, pretty close to massive or they can be quite small. Okay, bundles of axons. So this right here, this whole thing is a fascicle. These are surrounded by this tissue layer called the uh, perineurium. So the epineurium, kind of like the dura, right? The perineurium is a little bit more like the arachnoid, if you will, because it creates a diffusion barrier that we call the nerve tissue barrier. And the way that it does that is by forming tight junctions between the different cells that make up the perineurium, just like the arachnoid barrier cells do. The perineurium also creates a diffusion barrier, so anything nasty out here in the tissue can't get into our fascicles. No diffusion of nasty stuff because of the nerve tissue barrier. So the nerves the actual axons are protected against stuff in the rest of the tissue, in the epineurium, which is the kind of outer covering and all the junk between our fascicles. So all this that I'm coloring in right now, epineurium, bunch of connective tissue. Of course we have blood vessels scattered throughout, you got to pay the bill. Some of them are outside, that's usually where the nasty stuff comes from. Some of them are inside. We also have to have blood vessels within 
our fascicles. So we have axons, we have blood vessels, there's also some glia. Well, what about the nasty stuff in this blood? Well, that brings me to the last little bit of connective tissue here, the endoneurium. So kind of scattered throughout here. Endoneurium. So within the fascicles, we have our endoneurium. And what the endoneurium does is provide a little bit of support. So it creates some connective tissue to kind of hold the axons and blood vessels in place. It also communicates with the blood vessels to create uh, the blood nerve barrier. So it's not actually provided by the endoneurium, but the endoneurium creates tight junctions or, or instructs the vascular epithelia to create tight junctions. So within the endoneurium, we find the blood nerve barrier, but the endoneurium doesn't create it. All right, just keep that in mind. So our nerve tissue barrier surrounds the fascicles, and then inside the fascicles, tight junctions at the blood vessel create the blood nerve barrier. The endoneurium is just kind of more for support to kind of hold things in place. Now, axons can jump between different fascicles, so these things kind of merge and diverge as you move along a, a peripheral nerve. And that's why it can be difficult to put nerves back together if there's any sort of laceration and, and loss of any nerve segment. Even if there's a laceration and no loss of nerve segment, you have to align the nerve perfectly so that the fascicles line up on both sides of the cut. Any misalignment, it's going to create a problem for that axon when it tries to find its target. Now within these fascicles, I put little dots of different sizes because within our fascicles, we have axons of different sizes. And I've summarized them here for you in this table. What you should hopefully see is the trend that motor information moves faster than anything else. We prioritize motor function. That's probably the most important aspect of nervous system function is to control our bodies. So not surprisingly, we dedicate the largest axons to motor function. First of all, they are the motor neurons themselves, but they're also the sensory fibers that are connected to sensory structures in the muscle or the accompanying tendons. So the motor neurons that innervate extrafusal fibers, those are on top, that's the A alpha, so they're the biggest but also the sensory fibers that innervate the Golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles, which we'll talk about in following lectures. Those are the sensory elements that sense the tension at the muscle, it's the Golgi tendon organ, and changes in muscle length, that's the muscle spindle. Now muscle spindles also have slightly smaller axons in your A beta, so go one row down, 6 to 12 microns in diameter. The portions of the muscle spindle that sense static muscle length use slightly smaller axons. That's not as important as sensing changes in muscle length. Changes in muscle length are sensed by the A alpha, so we can have rapid stretch reflexes in case we have involuntary changes in muscle length. A beta is dedicated to sensing static muscle length. How long is it so I can have some idea of my body position? A beta fibers also innervate the encapsulated nerve endings uh, that are found scattered throughout the skin, tendons, so that we can have tactile sensation. There's another motor axon, if we go down, the, the A gamma fibers there, those are from gamma motor neurons that innervate intrafusal fibers at the muscle spindle. And they help regulate how long we think our muscle is. More on that in, in later lectures. But they're smaller neurons, so they conduct a little bit slower. A delta fibers uh, are sensory neurons that detect pain and temperature. So they hook up with some bare nerve endings. They're still myelinated, so they're, they're pretty fast, uh, but they're not as fast as the motor 
and, and other tactile sensory fibers. The B fibers there are from preganglionic autonomic neurons, so they're still myelinated. Remember that white ramus there? So they're much faster than the C fibers. The C fibers account for pain and temperature sensation and also postganglionic output. So the postganglionic neurons are unmyelinated, so they conduct action potentials slower than anything else, aside from other C fibers. So you'll notice here the conduction velocity, I've, I've organized it so fastest is on top, slowest is on the bottom. We emphasize um, movement, then sensation, and for sensation we emphasize tactile sensation over pain. That doesn't mean that pain isn't important. In, in fact, the pain sensing fibers, because they're small, are a little more excitable than other fibers. But because they're slow, their communication takes a little bit longer, so pain is a little more prolonged, partly because of this, but also because of the axon reflex that we went over in previous classes. So not every axon in that nerve conducts at the same speed. That's the point here. Moving our body requires fairly quick communication, so we dedicate the biggest axons there. Something that we don't really care about right away, but maybe want to hang around a bit longer like pain, we use the smallest unmyelinated fibers for that. So because there's myelin, of course we have glial cells there, but most of the Schwann cells don't actually myelinate axons. They surround them, but they don't actually myelinate. So the C fibers, which would be pain and temperature sensation, as well as autonomic, postganglionic autonomic output, those won't be myelinated. Now, of course, a myelinated axon, that's going to be surrounded by layer upon layer of myelin. And that's going to be carried out by a Schwann cell. So here's my axon, and that's myelin from a Schwann cell. The smaller, unmyelinated axons aren't just left out there to dangle in the endoneurium. They get a hug from nearby non-myelinating Schwann cells. All right, so they'll surround them, but they don't actually form myelin. There's some space. We still have ion channels on these unmyelinated axons. That's these black things here. And this fellow right there is a non-myelinating Schwann cell. For this, just think that it does this. Same thing as astrocytes. This is essentially the astrocyte of the peripheral nervous system. So it surrounds axons, just like astrocytes do, so the astrocytes just kind of touch at the nodes. Here, because we're an unmyelinated axon, we're all node. So the non-myelinating Schwann cells are there to help buffer ions as they're uh, extruded during action potentials. So they're going to soak up that potassium and make sure we don't have an increase in extracellular potassium. They're also, of course, going to help pay the bill. We want to keep our axons separated from blood vessels, so this is the middleman that supplies uh, um, glucose so that axons can pay the bill. And of course, they work together. So there will be other non-myelinating Schwann cells over here, which I'm not going to really draw on that much, but they're connected by gap junctions, so they can work as a network. We certainly have myelinating Schwann cells. This is true, and they're wonderful. But then there are non-myelinating Schwann cells, and those are the bulk of the Schwann cells that we find there. <clears throat> All right. So let's go through our spinal levels then. So um, again, the the dorsal and ventral roots come together, and they merge and exit at the intervertebral foramen. So that means we're going to have distinct levels where we have spinal roots arising. 
and the organization of those spinal roots follows the organization of our body tissues. Uh, the sensory portion we, we organize into dermatomes, so bands of skin. It goes from top to bottom. So if it's the face, that's the trigeminal. Then as you get to the back of the head, C2, and then move all the way on down before you get into the eventually coccygeal segment that gets right there in the anus. So just imagine uh, that we're four-legged and the organization makes absolute sense. We go from head to tail. Since we're not four-legged, it's a little weird. Um, you're you're going to go down, you know, C5 is going to kind of be your shoulder there, and we'll go go down the lateral aspect of the arm, C6 by the time you get to the forearm. It's probably good to know the hand. People think their their hands are really important. These things are handy. C5, I'm sorry, C6, 7, and then 8 here. C8 continues along the medial aspect of the forearm. You get to T1. By the time you're around T2 or so, you're in the trunk. T4, nipples, good one to know. It's a solid landmark. T10, the navel, also another solid landmark. Once you get below the waist, lumbar. We're going to go down the front of our legs and come up the back. Because remember, we're four-legged. We're not really two-legged. So, um, by the time you get to the sacral spine, you're in the sole of the foot. So, we go from the, the lumbar, kind of right here at the waist, we're going to go down to the bottom of the foot. Now you're in the sacral spine. You'll come up the back of the legs. And we end our journey uh, in the genitals and the anus. So you should have some sense of dermatomes. And I, I put a table in the notes for you that kind of hits some, some major landmarks. But it makes sense. When you go from top to bottom, you go from head to tail. Uh, you can see the dermatomes if you have a handy little map there in front of you. Keep in mind, though, these overlap substantially. If you were to cut just one... Uh, spinal root there, you wouldn't have an appreciable loss of sensation. It would probably go unnoticed. Uh, this is a little different if we talk about compression as opposed to cutting. Compression will create pain. Uh, you can also see the dermatomes uh, if you have shingles. So shingles is going to be caused by a reemergence of the, the chickenpox virus there, the uh, varicella zoster virus, because that lives dormant in the dorsal roots. In, more specifically in the dorsal root ganglia. When this reemerges, it causes blisters on the skin, and it's going to follow a band there. So we're right at the nipples, maybe a little below. I call that T5. T4 might be pretty good too, but a little below the nipples, I'd say maybe T5. So it helps to know these landmarks. The motor aspect also follows head to tail. It's a little more uh, complicated because it's a little more organized around movements. Uh, than, than muscles, but it basically follows it. Now, for the upper and lower limbs, there's about three roots to know for each. Right? The major roots for the arm would be C5, C6, and C7. Right? C5, a little more up here. 5 and 6 work together at, at bending at the elbow. C6 is a little more important uh, for the hand there, and C7 more so for extension at the elbow. For the leg, the major ones to know would be L4, uh, 5, and, and S1, just because they're more commonly affected in radiculopathies. Uh, but L4 is involved with extension at the knee, so the patella reflex. There isn't really a reflex for, for L5 there, and then S1 would be the Achilles reflex. But of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap here, kind of like in our dermatomes. You know, we have overlap of dermatomes, so they're not just clean bands, there's, there's overlap. Between them. And there's a lot of overlap with our roots and, and muscles. So, you know, a muscle could, could receive input from more than one root because roots kind of merge together to create peripheral nerves. And then one root, because it's diverging into to different nerves, can innervate more than one muscle. You know, so some of the, the movements that are going on in our upper and lower limbs, one movement might involve multiple roots, like, uh, you know, flexion at the elbow, uh, or it might just in involve one. You know, rotating the wrist, like that. So it's helpful to have some idea about the, the basic organization of myotomes. Really good to know your, your reflexes. We'll, we'll see those in, in just a little bit. Now, of course, dang, it's gone. <laughs>
um, sorry, at the intervertebral foramen, that's a compressible site. You can see it in the cartoon. Anytime you have nerves passing through a bony structure, whether it's a, you know, your, your carpal tunnel, um, or, or in this case, the intervertebral foramen, that's a potential site where a little bit of growth or a little bit of swelling, whether it be, you know, a, a tumor that invades or a little bit of bony outgrowth from the, the spine itself, puts pressure on the nerve and that of course causes demyelination uh, early on and it can eventually cause the loss of axons if it continues. But that pressure creates sensory and motor signs that follow those dermatomes and myotomes. They go from head to tail. Now the major ones to know would be those three for the upper and lower limbs because our limbs are pretty important to us. Certainly the trunk helps keep us balanced but Limbs are what we use to kind of navigate the world there. So, C5, more so the, the biceps reflex, that's going to be useful for detecting uh, C5 radiculopathies. Again, the sensory aspect there, C5 at the shoulder and kind of the lateral aspect of the, uh, of the arm. When you get into the forearm, and then we're in the hand for C6, digits 1 and 2. The reflex there, brachioradialis, can be tested a little down here. So again, we're moving down the arm, C5, C6, that makes sense. We're coming back up the medial aspect, so C7, that's going to be your triceps reflex, and just the third finger. Uh, C8 is going to hit the fourth and fifth digits and then have sensory innervation along the medial aspect. The, the three roots to know for the leg would be L4, L5, and S1. L4 and S1 have two reflexes that will be affected, so the patellar reflex, the, the knee jerk, and then the Achilles reflex. Of course, the sensory portions make good sense. We're going to go down the front of our leg, so L4. Uh, good to know that that's at the knee. That's a pretty um, well-known landmark for most people. They know where their knee is and then the medial aspect of the lower leg. Kind of wrapping around, L5 is going to hit the top of the foot and the big toe. And by the time you get to the sole of the foot, now we're in S1. So you can see here, L5 and S1, those account for the majority of uh, lumbosacral radiculopathies. A little bit comes from L4. The cervical radiculopathies are mostly from C7, uh, a healthy dose of C6, a little bit of C5, and then we have outside of those three roots. So these aren't the only ones that are affected in cervical radiculopathies. Uh, in those higher roots you'll, you'll see more neck pain. Um, so I can tell you that it's going to be somewhere above there. If it's C5, we're going to be in the shoulder. When you go above C5, then you start to move kind of toward the neck. Alright, that's probably enough for this. If anything's a little tricky or you want to review it in class, put it in the questions box. I'll see you in class.